the blood and they offer blood on the Passover, but it celebrated the Passover when they brought them out of Egypt uh, and out of the house of bondage. That's, the, that's on uh, the 14th day of April. Uh, the, the Day of Atonement, if I'm not mistaken, it's on the uh, uh, it's, uh, seventh day of the tenth day of the seventh month, all right? But the seventh month with them is not our seventh month, it's our tenth month. Uh, so the, we find here the Day of Atonement when you get to uh, chapter number 16. So we're going to break it down, very important day. Why? Wow, this was the atonement for the, for the people of Israel. The Old Testament was under atonement. What atonement means to put something off, to cover something up for a while. There's no saying never put off until tomorrow, what you can do today. Well, atonement was putting off until the Messiah came. It was a covering for sin just until Messiah came and then in the New Testament, you have propitiation. That means appeasement. God appeased when he uh, let his son down the cross of Calvary. So when you get into atonement, very important day. Uh, had nothing to do with their salvation. A lot of people uh, think that their salvation was through these feasts. They, they weren't. Uh, when they were in Babylon for 70 years, they had no sacrifices had no day of atonement. They didn't offer sacrifices, no days. They were saved in the Old Testament just like we are. They were saved by faith looking forward to Christ. We're saved by faith looking back to Christ. So salvation is faith on both ends, Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, you got a lot of so-called independent Baptists to confuse that. They believe that salvation was faith plus works in the Old Testament. It'll be faith plus works again after the rapture of the church. No man has ever been able to merit his salvation. We're not good enough. There's none good. The Bible said there's none righteous. All we like sheep have gone astray. Well, the Bible declares what we are. So the Day of Atonement was an important day as they were covering or putting off the judgment of God on their sin until it could be uh, uh, could be taken away through Christ. Now, once you look at verse number one, the first word is and. See that? You say, what's and? He's, he's tying you right into what we hey, back to Nadab and Abihu, all of these things happen just bang, bang, bang in the book of Leviticus. Sometimes we think a, a large portion of time is gone. But when Moses went up on Mount Sinai, he got the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. He brought those down, and now we've got ceremonial law. They're simply setting up how they're going to worship before the Lord. So he said, the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Abram, when they offered before the Lord, and they died. Why did they die? They offered strange fire. They offered something in a wrong way. You know, you can do uh, a, a right thing in the wrong way or a wrong thing in the right way, and you can be wrong either way you go. Now, a lot of people think, well, it doesn't matter how you get stuff done. You know, they say that the end justifies, the means justifies the end. You've got uh, a lot of people that believe that out here. Listen, we never have liberty to do wrong. We do not have liberty to do wrong in order for right to come out of it. We're just to do right and trust God with the consequences or the results of it. So what happened here, he's going, he's going to uh, talk to uh, Aaron. He's going to say to Moses, you speak unto Aaron, thy brother. Now, what's he going to do? He said, he's, he's laying a backdrop here. Listen, you do it right this time. It cost you two sons. It'll cost you your life again if you don't get it right. So Moses is now instructing Aaron how to go about the atonement. So the Lord said unto Moses, Moses, you speak unto Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark. Again, you get to break down the tabernacle. You came through the eastern gate into what's called the outer court. 
That's where you had your brazen altar. You had the labor in the outer court, uh, all of the slaughtering of animals, the offering of sacrifices was done here in what's called the outer court. Then when you went into the tent itself, when you went into the holy place, uh, we call it the holy place. And that's uh, when you came in, uh, as you were facing it on your right hand side would be the menorah, the candlestick, on the left hand side, the table of showbread. And before the veil, you had the altar of golden altar of incense where the high priest prayed. Then you had your veil. Then when you went through that veil, you had one article of furniture in there. You had the Ark of the Testimony over which the mercy seat was the top of that thing with the cherubims with their wings over the top where God spake. They worked every day in the outer court. They worked every day in the holy place. But when they came into the holy of holies, they could only come into that place once a year and that not without blood. Nobody went in there. That was veiled completely off until what's called the Day of Atonement. When that Day of Atonement came, then they could go in there. So he told Moses, he said, you don't just come all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. He said, now, if you go in there, it's not time to go in there, you're going to die. Again, when you go back to Exodus and they set up the priestly garments back in the book of Exodus, they had bells all around the bottom of that high priest. Uh, he was the only one that wore the bells, but around the skirt of his robe, around the bottom, you had those bells said so that they could hear him as he went about ministering before the Lord. If he died in that holy of holies, nobody could go get him. You went in there, you died also. Only one man, once a year, and that with the blood of atonement, could go in there. So what they did, and they, this, this is historical, but at the same time, it makes all the sense in the world. They had to be able to get a dead high priest out of there. So they said they tied a rope around his waist and when the bells quit tinkling, they pulled the rope and, and brought him out of the holy place because he'd die before the Lord. But he's letting Aaron know, this is not some place you just go all the time. Break that down to the New Testament. I thank God we can go to the Father all the time. You know, the, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. A lot of people confuse uh, the, uh, the model prayer with the Lord's prayer. When he said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That was a model prayer that he just said, I want you to pattern your praying after this. This is how I want you to pray. And he gave them a pattern to pray. People call it the Lord's prayer. The Lord's prayer is John chapter 17. There you find Christ in the Garden of Eden on his face before God, just before he went to Calvary. There he prayed for us. He prayed uh, for his children. He, he lifted uh, his voice up to God in, in boy, it's a tremendous chapter 17, book of John, tremendous prayer that the Lord prayed there. So we find that this is a place that you only went once a year and friend, if you, didn't, if you didn't go right and if you went at the wrong time, he said you would die before the Lord. You'll die. Now, notice what he said in verse 2, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. God spoke to Aaron upon that mercy seat when that blood was offered. Let's go back to where we are today. You can step into the throne room of God through Jesus Christ anytime you want to. How do we pray? Our Father which art in heaven. Huh? You're talking directly to God through the, the mediation and through the priesthood of Jesus Christ. He's our advocate. He prays for us when we can't pray for ourselves. That's what an advocate does. It speaks for someone who cannot speak for themselves. So we find the position of, of this high priest as once a year he went into that throne room of God. But look, verse number three, thus shall Aaron come into the holy place. Now he's going to tell him how he's got to come. With a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. 
Farther down in here, we're going to find that there were also two goats that, that were uh, a part of this Day of Atonement. Uh, so there's actually four sacrifices going to be made in chapter number 16. You're going to have two goats, you're going to have the ram, you're going to have the bullock. Each one of them had a different uh, job to do, a different work to do. They covered a different area. So he told him when he comes in, I want you to bring a young bullet for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So you've got two of the holiest offerings in, in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament that they're going to make uh, for them. Notice what he said. He said in verse number four, and he, Aaron, shall put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and he shall be girded with a linen girdle and with a linen mitre that's, that's on top of his head shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Now I want you to notice he had to take his high priest robes and things off. This is not the high priest garments. These are priestly garments, but they're not the, the, the clothing of the high priest. So when he started the day of atonement, he had to take off his high priestly garments and put on the linen garments from the top to the bottom. He was in white linen. That linen's a beautiful type of humility. It's a type of the righteousness of God. It's a type of purity. But he didn't come in with this first offering as a high priest. He's going to come in as an individual. Now notice what he said. He'll put these all on. These are the holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. So he had to take off his high priestly garments. Then once he took them off and took an all over bath, then he put on the linen garments from top to bottom. Now we're talking about the day of atonement. Normally we think of the high priest and his priestly, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But as he started this day of atonement, he had to take the high priest clothing off, put on the priesthood clothing of, of the individual priest and put them on. Verse number five, and he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and then one ram for a burnt offering. So now he's added the two goats. He said first, a bullock and a ram. A bullock for the sin offering, a ram uh, is for the burnt offering, and now he's bringing two goats for a sin offering, and he's bringing a ram for a burnt offering. Now there's no contradiction because he's gonna actually have to do two things. Verse six, and Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house before he ever made an atonement for the people of israel as a nation he had to bring a sin offering as an atonement for his own personal self and his household which was the aaronic priesthood so he had to offer for the priest first beautiful typology in here before a pastor prays for people is he needs to pray for himself. That's the first thing. He got to take care of himself. He got to make sure he's right with the Lord, his sins confessed. First thing you do when you go to God, I, I believe confession of sin is a very important thing. I think we need to make sure that we're right with the Lord. And then when we're right with the Lord, then we can pray for the other people uh, in our home. And by the way, that's the way I normally pray. I prayed myself, then I prayed my wife first after that. I prayed my children, grandchildren, family. Then I start praying for the church itself. I pray for the church corporately. I, I usually pray for it three ways. I pray that God would advance it spiritually, physically, and then financially. I pray in those three areas, and then I've got the prayer list of the people at the church, and I start down the prayer list church. I, I pray in an order every day. That's the way I've done that for years, and I think it's biblical to do that. I think you need to pray for yourself, then you need to pray for your spouse, you need to pray for your children, grandchildren, you need to go down that line, then pray for your church, and pray for your pastor, and pray for the people, and, and then you've got other, we've got prayer lists up here, people I don't even know 
who are on them. So we find that this thing was done in a very orderly fashion on the Day of Atonement. What he did was he offered that bullet, the sin offering for himself. That's why he does not have the high priest. Uh, the high priest represents somebody else to God. He's representing himself to God. So he comes just as an individual. Why? Aaron was a sinner just like everybody else was. He just simply was in the family of the high priest. God set that thing up that way. That didn't make him any more holy, didn't make him any better than anybody else. He needed a sin offering just like everybody else needed a sin offering. So he needed to learn to take care of his own self first and his family, and he did. Now, when he had offered this, notice what he said in verse number seven. He said he'd take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. If you'll notice in here, in this chapter, over 20 times, it says, and Aaron, or he did something, all right? So on the Day of Atonement, everything is done by the high priest, for the high priest, and done by the high priest, uh, for himself and both the children of Israel. So this day of atonement is something that Aaron did. But he said he took these two goats to present them before the Lord. Now, verse 8, he cast lots upon the two goats. You say, what's that? I just flip of a coin, all right? I th we would do it, we'd say heads or tails, you call them. Uh, you ever had anybody do that? We've all done that. They talk about the blonde joke. They said, do you understand football? She said, I certainly do. She said, they start by flipping uh, the quarter and see who gets the quarter. And then the rest of the time, they try to get the quarterback. All right. So that's what, that's, that's what football is all about, right? It's a lot was the flip of, of, of a coin. That's, they were just going to settle this. Why? It did not make any difference between the two goats. These two kid goats were the same. They were both without blemish. They were both kids. They were both small. They were lambs. They brought these two lambs in. And then he cast lots upon the two goats, one for the Lord. He said, now this is going to be for the Lord. The other one's going to be the scapegoat. Scapegoat that can take half a couple of men. You pardon me, my nose is itching right here on top, so I don't want to use my hands. So. Amen. But anyway, uh, he, he cast lots, and then one of them, this is going to be the Lord's goat, and this is going to be the scapegoat over here. So he divides these two goats as he begins to offer. Verse 9, And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. That goat died. One of them had to die. So that one belonged to the Lord, and so he had to be offered to the Lord in a biblical manner. They had to uh, kill this goat, shed this goat's blood. They had to offer it as a sin offering to the Lord. Notice what he said. He said it's presented, uh, uh, the sin offering in verse number 9, but look at the other goat. But the, the goat in verse 10 on which the lot, lot fell to be the scapegoat, shall be presented alive before the Lord. So one's going to be presented dead before the Lord. The other one's going to still be alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now we'll deal with that a little bit. But what they did, the scapegoat, one died for the sin, the other one carried the sin away. <coughs> So they're going to lay hands on one goat, pray over it. It's going to go into the wilderness. It's going to carry the sin into the wilderness. As far as the east is from the west, we can go through a lot of things. The other one died. So what Christ did, when Christ died on the cross of Calvary, he did both. One, he was the Lord's sacrifice. He died before the Lord. And then two, he carried those sins far Away. The Bible said that the, as uh, far as the east is from the west, said he hid them behind his back, never to look at them again. He put them in the uh, sea of forgetfulness, and uh, the Bible talks about what he does. What they're doing in typology, they're doing the same thing. When he died on that cross, one, he had to die, 
that belonged to the Lord, but he had to do something with the sins at the same time. And so he took care of the sins. So he appeased God into judgment, but then the sins had to be dealt with and had to be carried far away. And that's what he's doing with these two goats. Look at verse 11, and Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering. Now he's going to go back to the bullock, which is for himself and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. Now, after he does with these two goats, the first one that's actually offered is going to be the goat. That's going to be the sin offering. One goes to the Lord, one carries the sin away. Now, he's got to go back and take that bullock. Who's that bullock for? If you go right back to the first up here, he said that he would bring that bullock in verse number three for a sin offering, and that bullock was for him, all right? So now he's going to offer for his sins, and Aaron shall bring the bullock, verse number 11, of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. Now, he's going to do something with this bullock. This is the day of atonement. There's only one place that atonement can be, take place. And that's inside the Holy of Holies. So here he is, he's not in his high priestly garments. He's offering for himself. He's dressed in linen from the top of his head down to his feet. He's dressed in linen. And he's going to take that blood. He kills it for himself. Look at verse 12. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord and his hands full of the sweet incense beaten small and bring it within the veil. Now we find the censer now is not going to be, this prayer is not going to be offered at the golden offer of incense. That's where the priest does, hey, the morning and noon and evening, he would stand before the Lord and uh, in front of that altar of incense and burn it there in the holy place itself. But this time he's going to take that censer in. If you go to the book of Revelation, we're not going there, but the Bible said the temple was opened up in heaven and it said there were two things found in the holy of holies, the ark of the covenant and the censer. Now, the censer was only taken in twice. It was taken in once when he made atonement for himself, later when he makes atonement for the people. But then the censer comes back out because the, the high priest had to use that on a daily basis in front of that golden altar of incense in front of the veil. He'd take those coals off the altar, he'd take the incense and put it on it and put out a, a smell, a perfume, and he, his prayers went up to God through the incense. When you get to Revelation, you're going to find that that censer now is permanently fixed inside of the Holy of Holies where they are. Why? Because our high priest, he took care of it. He, he is always in the Holy of Holies before the Father uh, to, to allow us to make supplication and, and take our prayers before God. So he said he'd take that full of the fire, uh, verse number 12, and his hands full of the incense and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord. Now when he came in, he had his incense in one hand. He had the censer in the other hand. He didn't put the incense on the hot coals until he stood in front of that mercy seat. And when he stood there and made an atonement for himself, then he offered up the prayers of sin and, and, and took care of it right before God in that holy place. Now he put it up there that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. Verse 14, and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger second, seven times. Now, he took that blood of the bullock. What's it for? It's, it's a personal sin offering. It's a type of us today. We are our own priesthood. We're not high priest. But as he went in before the Lord, he's not the high priest. Do you see what he's saying here? 
He's wearing just regular priestly garments. He's not wearing that high priest. Why? When he goes before and he's offering that blood, he's doing that for himself individually. Now you bring that to the New Testament. We believe in the individual priesthood of the believer. We don't have priests in our day. I had a, a African prince the other day sent me a message and he was the apostle so-and-so. I, I get all this all the time. And I'm so glad that people around the world are getting to watch our services and things. But you got a lot of them, what I call Facebook beggars. Oh, they have, oh, well, I need this and I need that. You don't know who these people are. I mean, they, they, scammers are religious just like they're anything else. Uh, religion is big business. Uh, so they try to get money and all that. So I wrote him back and I said, you're not an apostle. The last apostle died 2,000 years ago and his name was John the Beloved. So he writes back and said, do you have any pastors? <laughs> I thought, now wait a minute, you told me you was the apostle, all right? Today, our high priest is Christ. He is the apostle and he is also the high priest of our profession. The Bible actually uses those two words. Hey, the priest, he, he uh, takes you before God. He, he introduces or represents you to God. The apostle represents God to you. Christ is actually doing both things. But in our day, there is no priesthood. You've got some religions that have priests. They have no comprehension uh, of Jesus Christ fulfilled that when he died and when he went to heaven, took that blood, he's become our high priest. Now we are individual priests. I don't have to go and pray to somebody that, in a confessional booth and say, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. And he tells me, go out and do 12 Our Fathers and 25 Hail Marys or whatever, and uh, put money in the offering plate and, and your sins be forgiven you. I thank God that we go just like Aaron did. That high priest went for himself, but not in high priestly. He understood that he had to bring himself before God and have that sin atoned personally before he as a high priest could bring the atonement for the children of Israel. So we find here he'd take that blood, sprinkle it on the mercy seat, sprinkle the blood seven times around. Seven, the Bible is called a perfect number. You've got perfect numbers. Uh, I, and I don't get a lot, I took courses in biblical numerology. Anybody ever heard of that? All right, that's a study, you know, the three's a trinity, uh, five's a number of grace, seven and 12, these are complete numbers, eight is a number of new beginning. I, I, listen, and, and I see that in the Bible, but they carry, it's kind of like uh, biblical hermeneutics, they carry it to another planet. All right, they do, they use things that I just don't use in the ministry. But at the same time, we find here that seven times a complete number, a perfect or completed number, that means that this is a perfectly completed sacrifice. It took care of it. It didn't take care of part of his sin. It covered it all for a year. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. You say, that's nice. No, ours is uh, taken care of for an eternity, folks. Man, they were under atonement, we're not. So now, verse number 15, then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people. Now they're gonna, he's gonna kill the atonement, the sin offering for the people. Remember, it got two goats. Lot fell on one, it belongs to the Lord. The other one was what's called the scapegoat. Now the scapegoat, he'll deal with him again in a few moments when he comes out. But the first thing he does, that scapegoat's still there. Because that scapegoat is no good until that blood has been shed and applied. So you've got to take it in the right order. Christ had to die before our sins were taken away. Well, that goat has to die. Now he's gonna take that goat, he's gonna bring it within the veil. He's gonna do it for the people, it's a sin offering. Notice verse 15, and to do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bullet. Now he's going to offer the, for them the same way he offered for himself. 
This is the atonement sprinkled upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Verse 16, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. You need to understand all this was built by man's hands. Built by man. He, he's he's going to have to cleanse the whole place. Not only the people, he's going to have to cleanse everything that's there. Notice he cleansed because of their transgressions and all their sins. In verse number 16, And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. He's, he's going to take this blood of this uh, uh, goat and he's going to offer and he's going to sprinkle blood. He's going to cleanse everything inside and out. He's going to have to offer because everything was made by man. So anything that man touches has sin attached to it. So he had to atone for the place just like he did for the people themselves. Look at verse number 17. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in it to make an atonement in the holy place. Now normally you got priests working inside the holy place all the time. They're trimming the candles and making sure there's oil in the candles and keeping, you know, the, the candles would never to go out. They're putting uh, fresh bread on the table of showbread. They're offering, they're working. For the first time, the only one in the tent is Abel. He's the only one that's in the tent. So we find him here as he offers that everybody else had to go out, all right? So we, he made an atonement uh, for the place itself until he come out and have made atonement for himself, for his household, and all the congregation of Israel. So he's atoning at the same time for everything. Look at verse 18. He shall go out unto the altar that's before the Lord, making atonement for it. Now he goes out to the brazen altar and sprinkles that blood of atonement on that because the one dying for sin and the place dying, hey, it had to be a holy place. So he's done the inside of the tabernacle. Now he's doing the outside. And the Bible said that he'll take the blood of the bullet in verse 18, the blood of the goat, and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. These horns were where they tied the sacrifices. When they brought the sacrifices in, they brought them to the brazen altar, they tied them to the four horns of the altar. And that's, that's where they offered them as a sacrifice. Notice what he said in verse number 19. He shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and howl it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Verse 20. Now, when he made an end of reconciling the whole, holy place, the tabernacle of the congregation, and the altar. Now, he's made an atonement of that. Now, he's going to bring, bring the live goat. This is the scapegoat. Verse 21, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. Now, this is a transfer, all right? This scapegoat is going to now bear the sins of these people. He's He's shed the blood for that, but now they're going to have to do something with the sins themselves. What he did, he took away the guilt, but now he's got to take away the penalty of sin. And he does it through this scapegoat, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man. I like that. Into the wilderness. Who was this? This was a very athletic man that could take that goat a long way. He's going to take a long trip, all right? He's going to take that goat as far as he can take him out into the wilderness, and the goat shall bear him all their iniquities, upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited. So he's going to take them out to where there's nobody. Just nobody. You go out west out there, some of you have been out west. I'm going to tell you what, when you leave town, you go out to where there's nobody. I remember we were out last time as I was out there, and I'm sure things have changed. There were no speed limits outside of the towns, uh, especially out in the desert areas. Uh, they didn't care if you drove 125. State trooper wasn't going to pull you over. They, hey, 
you just out there, you're on your own. Matter of fact, state troopers flew airplanes. And if you needed them, they landed right on the highways out there in the middle of the desert. They'd land out there. They said that if you're having trouble, you just put the hood up on your car, stay by the automobile, and a state trooper be along shortly. And what he did, he carried extra fuel, he carried water, he carried whatever you might need. He'd land right on that highway out in the middle of that. Now, didn't take you long. It'd say last chance for gas for 114 miles. Uh, they would just let you know you better fill your tank up. This, he carried this goat out to a place far away that's uninhabited. Why? Because if it's uninhabited, nobody can see that scapegoat. They need to understand under atonement, he still had to do something with the sin to keep everybody from seeing the sin of that people. So he took them to a place uninhabited where there were no prying eyes. Then he would turn him loose. Verse number 22, and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities and the land not inhabited. He shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And then he's going to come back. Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation, put off the linen garments which he put on. Now, what he's going to do, he's going to come back and put back his high priestly garments on. He's done this amount of the work. But he's not finished yet. When he started, he had to put off the priestly garments, dress in the linen garments. He had to make atonement for himself, for his house, for his people. He's taking care of this step by step. I thank God again. You go back. I'm glad this morning that Calvary covers it all. Man, we don't have to do this stuff, folks. If you've got a priesthood, he's got to do this. I'm going to stop there uh, this morning because of time I was reading. I read after a modern day uh, Jewish priest, an Orthodox priest. And see, they don't sacrifice animals anymore. There hasn't been a sacrifice of an animal since Titus of Rome destroyed that temple in 70 AD. It all stopped. Now when they have the Passover, they have a piece of lamb and they have certain things on their plate that they eat and all this. But there's not been a sacrifice for sin made. There's not been a sacrifice uh, for atonement made. The priesthood now becomes, I guess, your own priesthood again, even though they have priests over there because you have your own meals and all this type of stuff. But we find out that this thing had to be done right. Now he's going to go back. They've turned loose that goat. This fit man will come in and wash and change his garment. He'll wash his garments and he'll come back into the camp. And the next thing that high priest is going to do is now he has to undress and wash again. And he's going to put on those priestly garments because now they're going to finish the atonement for the people. And as a high priest, now he is ready to do that through personal sacrifice, through cleansing everything that had any human touch to it. He cleansed everything that was there, and now he's going to finish up. Next week, Lord willing, we'll finish up. I don't know if that's what I'll do next Sunday morning. That's going to be last Sunday before Christmas. So we may just do something else on that Sunday morning. But we'll get back into it, the work of that high priest. It was something he had to do first for himself and then for the sins of the people. And when he did it that way, then it atoned for the sin. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Lord, a lot in here. And Lord, just so much typology that we could, we could spend literally days uh, in this chapter. Uh, but I just pray, Father, that you'd help us to grasp, one, the seriousness of sin. And then, Lord, to grasp the glory of what Christ did when he took our sins away. I pray, Father, you bless the service to come. Give us a good day today. Meet the need of every heart. Be with our people that are out sick. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, going to the prayer rooms.